Our sponsor Cook Unity is the only meal subscription that brings locally sourced meals from award winning chefs right to your door every week. Cook Unity is a collective of some of the best chefs in the country, handcrafting meals in their micro kitchens delivered fresh, never frozen. There are hundreds of dishes to choose from. The menu is updated constantly. Pick as few as four or as many as 16 meals per week. Go to cookunity.com slash Pacman and use the code Pacman before checkout for 50% off your first week. Reproductive rights continue to plague Republicans and especially MAGA Republicans as Democrats have their first net seat pickup in the Alabama State House dating all the way back to 2002. And although the reproductive rights suppression is a disaster, seeing it have consequences where Republicans continue to lose everything since the overturning of Roe v. Wade and now since Alabama's IVF law was passed is a good thing. That's right. It's good for political actions to have consequences. And that is exactly what we are seeing in Alabama. Take a look at this 62 to 38. State Rep elect Marilyn Lands won the special election for House District 10 yesterday, uh, two days ago, making her the first net gain Democratic pickup in the Alabama legislature since 2002. 22 years. 22 years. What happened? Well, one prominent Republican official said Democrats nationalized the campaign ab around abortion to scare Republicans and to try to um, uh, fundraise off of it. One complaint was that the Republican nominee, Teddy Powell, was too moderate in his approach and said if Democrats want to win, if Republicans rather want to win purple districts, they have to be full on Republicans. In other words, Lands ran as a full on Democrat and the Republican ran as a moderate and this hurt them. It's really important to understand the more sensible perspective here, which is that now that they are getting what they want, in a sense, exactly as predicted, Trump won in 2016, got his Supreme Court picks, those picks overturned Roe v. Wade. And most Americans said, wait a second, we think abortion should be legal in most cases. And now Republicans have had loss after loss after loss after Roe v. Wade was overturned. Similarly, Alabama passes this IVF bill which says a uh, frozen embryos in IVF clinics are people. Essentially, they have personhood and all of a sudden sane and logical people all over the state are saying, hey, you know what? I may be religious, but all of a sudden now you're going to put IVF clinics in a port in a position where they say we don't even want to be in this business at all because of the risk of legal problems, criminal problems, who the hell knows? That's not good. That's the government getting involved where it shouldn't get involved. And now you see a Democrat win and a net Democratic pickup for the first time in 22 years. The Biden Harris campaign put out a statement about this where they said, quote, last month, Alabamans lost access to fertility treatments because of Donald Trump tonight. The voters in Alabama's 10th House District elected a pro-choice champion in Maryland lands, sending Trump and extreme MAGA Republicans a clear message. They know exactly who's to blame for restricting their ability to decide how and when to build their families, and they're ready to fight back. Trump overturned Roe v. Wade, paving the way for attacks on women's freedoms like we saw in Alabama. Now he's running to ban abortion and got access to IVF nationwide. Tonight's results should serve as a major warning sign for Trump. Voters will not stand for his attacks on reproductive health care. This November will be no different. Now, it is important, and we're going to talk about this in the forthcoming segment. It is important to remember that no matter what happens, no matter what we see, no matter what momentum we think we have, no matter what anti MAGA momentum we believe we might be seeing, the only way to make it a reality is by voting. That's as uh, former President Barack Obama explained. Obama. That guy. Uh, what we have to do is bo vote. Booing. OK, you can boo. Clapping. All right, you can clap. Whatever else. Right. But we have to vote at the end of the day to make this a reality. But 
we also can't ignore because at the end of the day, we're doing an, a, an analysis of what we are seeing. It would be strange for me to ignore that electorally, not only has MAGA Trumpism not been so good for Republicans, we know that, but also the assault on reproductive rights has not been good. And we have seen a ballot referenda on abortion rights go the opposite way of uh, overturning Roe v. Wade since Roe v. Wade was overturned. IVF is having an impact and it is having a real electoral impact here. Now, the, the other part of this, and we're going to look at this in the next segment when we talk about a Charlie Kirk clip on IVF. The other uh, aspect of this that's important to understand is that even Republicans have moderated on these issues of reproductive rights. And they've moderated on other social issues as well, including, for example, gay marriage, which, by the way, can you imagine still being opposed to gay marriage? But there are people who are still opposed to gay marriage. It's wild. It's wacky. But it's the United States. After all, um, we have seen abortion be as much on the side of it should be legal in most situations more than ever, just on the cusp of it being overturned. And the reason why Republicans kept pushing is they were able to raise money on it. There were moneyed interests that were interested in donating and focusing around ban abortion, even if the public perspective on it has shifted more and more to the left. It's happened on IVF, 80, 90 percent support for IVF uh, uh, services. Uh, it's shifted on gay marriage, as I've said. It's shifted on economic and other issues as well. But the difference is the social issues remained for a while and whether they still do is an open question, really good fundraising tools for the right, even as public opinion shifted against them. So we are seeing the we're seeing the proof in the pudding in the banana pudding. We are seeing it. This is not going well for Republicans. And, it, you know, you want to talk about a bloodbath. We could see an electoral bloodbath. See how it's obvious I'm not talking about violence. We could see an electoral bloodbath in November. Uh, the likes of which maybe we've never seen if we all get out and vote, if turnout is up, if we do the right thing. So now let's talk about the latest example of the Republican panic over IVF. Charlie Kirk may look like he doesn't know what's going on, <laughs> but he can see what's going on with regard to reproductive rights. He is uh, the guy from Turning Point USA, an organization focused on getting young people to become right wing extremists. But he sees how the tide has been turning on abortion and on IVF. And after the House District 10 defeat for MAGA Tuesday night in Alabama, partially on the on the heels of the IVF law, he is saying we shouldn't throw away an election because of something that is relatively not controversial among the public. He says it would be a shame if we didn't do well in November because we just can't get our act together on this issue. Now, Republicans have a long history of not getting their act together on many issues. But the point he's making is a good one, which is support is almost unanimous behind access and legality when it comes to IVF. And yet Republicans are not working in a way that is going to get them electoral victories. Listen to the panic and then we'll discuss. And you see here in the House seat in Alabama, it can swing a Republican district by 26 points. Yep. The issue really is on the discarding of embryos. And I think a pragmatic middle of the road approach is don't discard them, have them donated or have them stored for potential for future use in vitro fertilization, which essentially takes the female egg fertilizes it. It's sex ed with Charlie Cork and then re implants the egg during the ovulation period with the attempt for the egg to attach to the uterine wall. And if it sticks, then the continue the continued fertilization process <laughs> is able to hopefully get through gestation. Right. And the baby can develop and be born after 40 weeks. But what a shame it would be. If all of a sudden we have an underwhelming election mm. this November, because we cannot get our act together on an issue that 80 to 90 percent of the people are of this country are in enthusiastic support of IVF. 
Now, there's a couple things here that are worthy of some discussion. First of all, what exactly is middle of the road with IVF when either you are arguing that it's a person at conception or you are not? Now, Charlie is trying to get around that fundamental issue and the problem it causes for IVF clinics by saying, just don't discard embryos. Either they have to be donated or whatever the case may be, as if that solves the problem. But it's not really middle of the road and it doesn't really solve the problem. If the law states that uh, embryos created via IBF, IVF are people because personhood begins at conception, you are going to scare the bejesus. Is it still OK to say bejesus? I don't even know what it means. Um, you are going to scare IVF clinics, even if you if, if they take the approach or you say, well, we're not going to discard. You are still going to scare them about what is our potential legal liability here? It completely changes the scope of how all of these places operate. And many of them might just say we're bailing out. We don't want anything to do with this or the costs will become in states that don't cover where insurance doesn't cover IVF. There are states where IVF is covered by medical insurance by law and states where it is not in states where it is not covered. It is going to prohibitively spike the cost of this service. So the idea that, hey, listen, let's not screw it up. Let's just take a middle of the road approach. Embryos are people, no discarding of embryos and they get donated. Or, oh, and who pays for the storage when they have been donated? and no longer belong, for lack of a better term, uh, to the couple whose DNA it is. These are all very real details that make the just take a middle of the road approach not make a whole lot of sense. Now, then there's another aspect to this, which is Charlie says we, we got to get our act together on this because otherwise we may perform underwhelmingly, even if they're able to, quote, get their act together when it comes to IVF, which in my view, would mean you have to say frozen fertilized IVF embryos are not people. That's the only way to really get your act together in a sane way. But imagine they do it and they somehow get their act together. Trump's going around reminding everybody it's thanks to him that Roe v. Wade was killed. And people don't like that. This is hurting Trump to the point where Trump is now his head is spinning around. What should he say about abortion? Because he wants credit for the three Supreme Court justices that did the thing he promised they would do. I mean, that we we warned people in 2016, this is how it would go. He'll get Supreme Court justices on the court. It'll become the most right wing court, arguably in history, certainly in 100 years. And then they're going to do away with abortion rights. It happened. Trump started taking credit. Then every time that this was up on the ballot after Roe v. Wade was repealed, Republicans lost. Trump realizes, oh, maybe this is not so good of an idea to be bragging. So now it's are you going to support an abortion ban federally or not? And are there exceptions? Are there not? So the point here is, even if Charlie, not out of out of uh, out of any ethical concern for reproductive rights or women's autonomy or any of it, just because he wants to win elections, if Charlie Kirk is able to convince Republicans to, quote, get their act together, Trump will ruin it by continuing to dissemble and equivocate on thanks to me, we overturned Roe v. Wade, but there should be exceptions. But I might do a federal abortion ban or I might not. But thank me for this and thank me for that. Even if you hate all of it, just pick the thing you like, which is basically Trump's position. I'll take every position on every issue. Pick the one you like and that agrees with you. Trump potentially will spoil this. So listen, anything can happen in November and we have to be super cautious about resting on our laurels um, or, or, or in any way that might disincentivize people from voting. But there is the potential for the assault on reproductive rights to really hurt Republicans in November. That would be correct. It would be appropriate. It makes sense when elected officials do stuff and then suffer consequences based on public opinion about the things they do. That's the right way for politics to work. We we, we vote in reaction to what is done. It often isn't the case because people are bamboozled or lied to or they don't know what our elected officials are doing or whatever the case may be. The country is mostly in favor of all of these reproductive services being available and being legal. Republicans are increasingly continuing to be against it. And so they deserve to lose if people vote based on their political positions. Let's see what happens. Charlie Kirk is worried. 
and he should be worried. If you're a foodie, you know how expensive and time consuming it can be to explore your local food scene and find new things. And this is why I love our sponsor, Cook Unity. Unlike other meal subscriptions, Cook Unity is the first ever collective of award winning chefs delivering locally sourced culinary marvels to your door every week. Every meal is handcrafted by chefs. It's made in local micro kitchens, not those large production facilities. And the real kicker is that it's actually more affordable than many other meal subscriptions. There's no cooking. The food is ready to go. The food arrives fresh, never frozen. I absolutely loved trying out the recent chili roasted shrimp. I've tried a half dozen or so different meal subscriptions over the years. And what sets Cook Unity apart really is just the quality of the dishes. It's clear that each recipe was developed by a professional chef. These are not those monotonous, boring meals you get from some other services. And for me, another one of the big downsides to the other services is so much packaging garbage that they generate, which is why I love that all of Cook Unity's packaging is either compostable or recyclable. Go to cookunity.com slash Pacman and use the code Pacman before checkout for 50 percent off your first week. The link is down below. Pacman show is an audience funded program, of course, depending on your support. You can get the full member experience by signing up at joinpacman.com. We do some great things for our members, quite frankly, folks. Uh, commercial free audio and video streams of the show. We do an extra show every single day for our members and many other miscellaneous perks, which you can read about at joinpacman.com. You can also use the coupon code Save Democracy 24 to get a discount. And also, we've re because the situation with Trump is getting so sad, we've also reinvigorated the old coupon code Sad Trump. Sad Trump which you can use for also a sizable and respectable discount. Well, Fox hosts cannot tolerate that former RNC chairwoman Ronna McDaniel was fired by NBC and MSNBC after on air blowback and behind the scenes blowback from NBC staffers, on air talent, producers and others. As a reminder, NBC announced we're hiring Ronna McDaniel, the former RNC chairwoman, who went along with Trump's claims that the election was stolen from him, who started to participate in that scheme to generate a slate of fake electors to try to steal the election from Joe Biden. The de facto insurrectionist Ronna McDaniel was hired by MSNBC, NBC and uh, on air talent, including Chuck Todd, Rachel Maddow, the Morning Joe crew and others said uh, this is not good. She's not going to be on our show or we are against this or whatever the case may be. And ultimately, as I reported to you yes yesterday, NBC made the decision that she's fired, that they are going to part ways. Well, the folks over at Fox News are not happy. We'll look at a couple of different clips, including Judge Janine, Janine Pirro, saying that MSNBC hosts should apologize. Apologize for what exactly? Well, this you have to hear. Honestly, what I think is those hosts should apologize to their viewers and say, we're sorry that we want to impose <laughs> one ideology on all of you. And anyone who differs from us is a liar. Wait a second. MSNBC should apologize for wanting to impose only one ideology on their viewers. That's Fox News's business model. Oh, but David, they have Jessica Tarlov on the five. Yes, it's a 24 hour news network and they do have Democratic strategist Jessica Tarlov on the five for one hour a day, five days a week. Irony is dead. And remember, it's not about ideology. Voices on MSNBC and NBC that believe we need less government regulation appear all the time. Voices that believe we need less taxation or that the U.S. should be the world's policemen around the world or whatever. Those voices are welcome. Ronna McDaniel is not someone with whom we disagree about the top tax rate. She played a critical role in putting together the fake elector slates to try to defraud the tens of millions of Americans who voted for Joe Biden. Then we go to Greg Gutfeld. Greg Gutfeld says 
it's also bad and they should be ashamed of themselves for firing Ronna McDaniel. Didn't contact McDaniel about the decision to ax her. And she only found out with the rest of the world through media reports. Greg, um, what is going on over there? This is why people love mocking the media. It's because of their blind spots. And all <laughs> these people have this one giant blind spot about themselves. They're mean girls. That's all they are. They're mean girls who failed up. The joy and thrill over ejecting an outsider, it's no different than a group of cheerleaders, you know, targeting some nerdy girl because she doesn't dress as well as they do. Spiritually, they're ugly, and they did this because she was different. It's what? a class thing, you know, dressed up as a difference of opinion, but it's a class thing. You can see it. The children won. Understand how absurd and pathetic these analogies are. Mean girls. It's about class. It's a what is Greg Gutfeld talking about? And by the way, I know Greg Gutfeld's a comedian. I don't know if this is maybe this is a comedy skit that I just don't understand or that fails to be funny. And think about why uh, Mc, McDaniel was hired. The adults in the room knew that this insurrection thing was a puffed up lie. And so they wanted opinion different from the prevailing hysteria in their uh -huh. newsrooms. So they just basically wanted a different perspective. And the children threw a tantrum. They thought they were being Jerry Maguire, but they're more like Jerry Springer. It's like Lord of the Flies meets daytime TV. The, the, wow, these analogies and metaphors are really falling flat. But I wouldn't be that cocky if I were Chuck or Joe or Mika or Joy, because look what happened to Don Lemon. After getting the boot from X, he did his own show and it flatlined. No one is watching him. So what does that tell you about him and other mediocrities like Chuck and so on, that they actually have no natural audience? You remove the NBC platform and they're gone. By the way, if Gutfeld was pulled off Fox News and started a podcast, would anyone listen to that? I don't know that this is a great argument in defense of what he's doing. Uh, you tell me if I'm wrong. You know, Rachel has a career outside, but the rest, they're as replaceable as contestants on The Bachelor. You can't even remember their names because they just serve a purpose. And again, it's another example of how rather than competing with any kind of I don't know, prevailing a, a, a different opinion or a perspective, whether it's in elections or speech. Or All right. So you get it. They are pretending like NBC just doesn't want different opinions. Different opinions appear on NBC all the time. The revolt was because this is a borderline unindicted co-conspirator in an attempt to defraud the country and install a candidate who didn't win as president of the United States. These are not mere differences of opinion. Howard Kurtz also saying why not let Rana up there and express her occasional pro Trump views? That's all this is. And so I have to think what whatever McDaniel's bag is, what would have been the great harm in allowing her to occasionally express pro Trump views? What is MSNBC protecting its audience from? Remember, this is the network that boasts about not taking many Trump speeches uh, on primary right. nights, caucus nights, courthouse appearances, because, you know, he's only going to start lying. They don't get it. They don't get it. This is not about her views or her opinions. This is not about dissent. This is not about any of it. And by the way, the people at Fox acting as if Fox is filled with Democrats with different opinions. It's like, uh, you know, Jessica Tarlov, occasionally Harold Harold Ford Jr. is up there. But it's not like they are putting these voices up on anything approximating equal footing. So they are in a glass house and throwing stones. They don't understand the difference between let's have a disagreement about tax rates versus I tried to install the guy who lost as president undemocratically. And MSNBC and NBC ultimately made this decision. It's not a free speech issue. It's not a First Amendment issue. It is, by the way, something Fox News usually is in favor of, which is a business deciding what's best for them. And they decided Carl Rove is sounding the alarm. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. could cost Joe Biden the election. We're going to take a look at a clip from yesterday wherein a Democrat, a Republican strategist and a former advisor to George W. Bush, Carl Rove, explains the math of how Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s candidacy now, I guess, bolstered, although I'm not sure, bolstered by Nicole Shanahan and as, as his vice presidential running mate who effectively bought her vice president uh, uh, a slot. 
donated like four million to a pack. Next thing you know, she's his VP running mate. Karl Rove explains this could be very, very bad for Joe Biden. Let's listen to what Rove has to say, uh, and then we will discuss the changing perspectives on who is most hurt by RFK Jr. Third parties, they're like cockroaches in the kitchen. Okay, it's not what they carry off that upsets you. It's what they fall into and foul up. Okay, Bobby Kennedy could fall into every swing state and foul it up for for Joe Biden. This is the one of the biggest threats um, to Joe Biden being reelected. I do worry that Bobby just taking some percentage of votes from Biden could shift the election and lead to Trump's election. Well, it sounds like a red alert. Uh, now that RFK Jr. has named a running mate, choosing entrepreneur Nic Nicole Shanahan as his VP pick, Democrats are ramping up efforts to try to knock him out of the race for the White House, and they're raising concern again and again. Let's bring in Carl Rove, former White House Deputy Chief of Staff, Fox News contributor. Carl, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, are they right to worry as much as they do? And what do you think of uh, Nicole Shanahan as uh, RFK Jr.'s pick? Yeah. Well, they should worry. Uh, in 2016, third-party candidates got 5.8 percent of the vote. That's one out of every 17 voters cast a ballot for a third-party candidate. And in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, the Green Party candidate got more votes than Hillary Clinton lost those states by. In 2020, 1.9 percent, one out of every 50 voters, voted for a third-party candidate. And in Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin, the Libertarian candidate got more votes than Donald Trump lost those states by. So even if they get a, a very small fraction of the vote, if it's in the right places, it can cost, uh, cause enormous harm. Carl, right now, I mean, he's got a lot of potential in key swing states, but he's only on the ballot in Utah. Is anybody pushing back on the other side of this, anyone who doesn't work for the Biden campaign and saying some of this fear-mongering is overblown? Well, it, he is behind the eight ball, but but look, there, a number of states, 20 some odd states require you to have a running mate before you can get on the ballot. So, uh, it, you know, you either could get on the ballot last year without a without a for a party with, before you nominated a candidate. But now that he's an independent candidate, he has to have a running mate to get on in a number of states. So we don't know how many he's going to end up getting. But in 2016, a, a dissident Republican got on the ballot in 20 some odd states and received votes in 37 states, even though he didn't even become a candidate. All right. So I think you get the point. There are some states there in which uh, if you didn't see the map, they were marking states where RFK is not yet on the ballot, but has the signatures to get on. Um, Arizona was there. Georgia was there. Michigan was there. These are critical states for Joe Biden, without a doubt. So you might be saying, wait a second, David. At one point, everybody was saying RFK hurts Trump. At another point, it was RFK hurts Joe Biden. Then it was Trump. Now it's Biden. Who exactly does RFK hurt? Well, the, the answer is it depends on which state you're talking about. It depends whether he's officially on the ballot or only a write in. And it depends uh, um, also on what the poll you look at is. We should assume for our purposes that RFK clearly and cleanly hurts Joe Biden in, in our assessment of, oh, you know what? I live in a state that's not usually down to the last one percent. It's usually, you know, the Democrat wins by five or six. We should not assume that that is a safe state. We should assume every state might come down to our vote. Now, I know that in a literal sense, that's not the case, but that's the way we should be playing this because the data are unclear. But Carl Rove is not wrong. It's certainly plausible, plausible that RFK is very bad for Joe Biden and may actually help Donald Trump get himself reelected. Now, in terms of polling, it's really all over the map. There is a brand new YouGov poll which has it Biden and Trump basically tied with Kennedy at three, Jill Stein at one and Cornell West at zero. So certainly that's one where at least mathematically, even though Kennedy doesn't get much, he has the potential to foul it all up. You look at a beacon research poll, which is done for Fox News. You see Trump winning by five with Kennedy 12, certainly a state in which Kennedy's presence. I'm sorry, certainly a poll in which Kennedy's presence may foul up the entire thing. You look at Quinnipiac University. Quinnipiac has it essentially tied 
Kennedy 13, Stein 4, West 3. Now, here's the really important thing. When people are polled, they aren't responding relative to the presence on the ballot of these folks. There are some people saying I support Kennedy and then they're going to get to the ballot to the uh, polling place on November 5th and then they won't see Kennedy there and then they'll pick from Trump or Biden. So that is a factor in many states. We can slice and dice this however you want. The safest thing is to assume Kennedy's bad for Biden and we need to make sure everyone knows you've got to get out and vote. Donald Trump immediately violating the gag order again, attacking the daughter of Judge Juan Merchan. Is he going to pay some kind of price for this? Less than 24 hours after the gag order was put in place on him for attack, attacking his daughter to begin with, Trump once again taking to Truth Social and laying out the following tirade. Quote, Judge Juan Merchan, who is suffering from an acute case of Trump, Trump derangement syndrome, whose daughter represents crooked Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Adam Shifty Shift and other radical liberals, has just posted a picture of me behind bars, her obvious goal and makes it completely impossible for me to get a fair trial, has now issued another illegal, un-American, unconstitutional order as he continues to try and take away my rights. This judge, by issuing a vicious gag order, is wrongfully attempting to deprive me of my First Amendment right to speak out against the weaponization of law enforcement, including the fact that crooked Joe Biden, Merrick Garland and their hacks and thugs are tracking and following me all across the country, obsessively trying to persecute me while everyone knows I have done nothing wrong. First of all, a reminder, gag orders are not unconstitutional. Gag orders have been determined many times to be completely constitutional and there to preserve the rights of uh, witnesses, members of the jury, the right to a fair trial, etc. But most importantly, the two tier justice system. If anyone not like Trump did what he's doing, attacking a judge's daughter, gag order is placed, attacking her again. If any of us did this, we would be in huge trouble, possibly in jail pending trial. Imagine reading a headline about any other presidential candidate, by the way, attacking the judge's daughter in his porn star hush money trial. And then you find out he's selling Bibles for sixty dollars. It would rightfully be a complete and total humiliation. That candidate would be abandoned. And yet, despite all of that being true about Trump, he is still potentially going to become president of the United States. So he should be sanctioned. He should be punished, not because I don't like the guy, but because he's repeatedly violating gag orders. And obviously he deserves to lose all of his support. He's not losing it. And by some measures, he may be gaining it. An insane state of affairs. Don't forget that the best way to support the David Pakman show is by becoming a member, which gives you access to the daily bonus show, the regular show with no commercials. You also get access to our entire archive of every episode dating back a really long time and plenty of other awesome membership perks. Go to joinpacman.com. Joinpacman.com. Joe Biden appears to be setting up a brilliant plan to completely ambush Donald Trump. And I want to talk about it with you. There's an interesting Daily Beast article by Jake LaHoot called the Biden campaign is quietly preparing a Trump ambush, uh, adding the ingredients for a Biden comeback are falling into place at a moment in the 2024 campaign when Trump is mired in legal and financial problems. Let me give you the elements of this. The election season started with Joe Biden and historically low approval ratings in polling in individual battleground states. I told you some time ago, uh, Biden was trailing Donald Trump. Uh, Biden was trailing Donald Trump in national polling as well. And you had some on the left openly saying Biden's got to be replaced. This guy is going to lose. There's no way he can win his age, his campaign's viability, his ability to make the case that he's had successes. It's all terrible. But things have so slowly started to change. We are seeing improvements in those battleground state polls. We are seeing Biden's approval rating 
go up. All signals that Biden may be surging, uh, surging. That is, he had a very solid State of the Union address, which changed the minds of many Americans from thinking the country was going in the wrong direction after seeing the speech to thinking the country is now going in the right direction. And since the State of the Union address, and I saw inklings of this in my off the record meeting with VP Kamala Harris in D.C. on the day of the State of the Union address, Biden and Harris and the campaign are adopting a more combative approach. They're going directly after Trump. They're going directly after the losses caused by MAGA, like, for example, the loss in the Alabama House race uh, that we talked about from Tuesday. And so the Biden campaign now is seeing this really translate into results, not only in polling, but in these insane fundraising numbers. I believe campaign finance is broken. I want public financing of election with limited election periods. We don't have that and we can still use uh, donations as a proxy to voter enthusiasm. And Joe Biden raised fifty three million dollars in February. He has roughly a hundred million to hundred and twenty million dollar advantage in cash on hand over Donald Trump. These are cuckoo numbers. And so this gets us now to the strategy for what may be a forthcoming ambush. The Biden campaign is going to start leveraging its financial lead to focus on travel, organizing, hitting battleground states and media blitzes in those states. The early voter mobilization aspect of the campaign with Biden visiting the major battleground states is going to go directly at. We know exactly where we need to win in order to remember Biden doesn't have to do better than 2020. He won 2020 with a significant electoral vote margin. He just has to do that well. And on the other side, you see what Trump's up to the Trump campaign, not very active. Trump staying at Mar-a-Lago, winning trophies handed out by his own golf clubs for golfing going from courthouse to courthouse, and his first trial is set to start in just a couple of weeks. The Trump campaign is downplaying the need to do the sort of organizing uh, that Joe Biden is starting to do. But they're going to have to do something here because Biden's polling is improving. His fundraising is off the charts, and it really shows the Trump vulnerabilities that are going on here. So a couple other things we do not yet know the degree to which Trump is going to be hampered in his ability to campaign once the trials start with the trial starting April 15th, Trump has to be in court from what I most recently read, unless something changes, Trump has to be in court for week. I guess they have Wednesday off Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, morning to afternoon, like a roughly nine to five day. Trump has to be in court and he's supposed to be campaigning during this time. So there is a really good trajectory here for Joe Biden to launch this ambush on Trump, and it may get very ugly for Trump. But at the same time, just because I'm reporting this to you, we have to remember that complacency got us to where we are today. Complacency about I don't know that Hillary's really better than Trump. I might stay home. I might dabble in writing someone in. Well, that got us Trump, three Supreme Court picks and subsequently the overturning of Roe v. Wade gutting of voting rights and so many other disasters. So the complacency is not the takeaway. None of this is an invitation to stay home unless you vote by mail, in which case feel free to fill out your ballot from home and, and mail it in. The bottom line is super simple. The visions presented by four more years of Biden or another four years of Trump couldn't be more different. Biden's been a fine president. Many things have gone well. The country is obviously so much better off than it was when Trump left. On the other hand, the alternative is Trump, one of the ugliest, not physically, but rhetorically and in terms of what he represents, one of the ugliest candidates we've ever seen left the country uh, as a laughing stock. And we need to make sure that this is the message that's getting out. The competing visions couldn't be more different. And let's hope that in addition to a Biden reelection, we get some consequences for the people who did those horrible things when Trump was president one of whom I want to talk about next. Donald Trump's former lawyer, John Eastman, is finally getting what he deserves. He has been disbarred. This is great news. It's great news, not because I personally have a problem with the guy. Maybe he's a nice guy. Maybe he's a good father. I don't know if he has kids, whatever. But this was an architect of one of the most sinister attempts to subvert democracy in American history. 
Politico reporting John Eastman, architect of Trump's 2020 election plot, should be disbarred. A judge has ruled. Judge Yvette Rowland wrote the most severe available professional sanction is warranted to protect the public. Remember, this is the guy who wrote the memos. Here's how maybe Mike Pence can try to overturn the election. Here's how maybe the slates of fake electors can overturn the election. And we now have the declaration. Here is the paperwork and it is signed by Yvette Rowland. And it indeed says uh, John Charles Eastman is ordered transferred to involuntary inactive status pursuant to the Business and Professions Code Section 6007, Subdivision C4. His inactive enrollment will be active three calendar days after this order is served and will terminate upon the effective date. He has been barred by he has been disbarred by the State Bar Association. Uh, this is what he deserves. This is the right thing. And I want to remind you of this classic moment involving John Eastman. A Trump White House attorney, Eric Hirschman, during his deposition, author of the Trump memo, said uh, that at a certain point it became clear people are going to need lawyers. People are going to need lawyers. And it was time to stop attempting to overturn the election. I love this moment. Eastman, I don't remember why he called me He's in a, or he texted me or called me, wanted to talk with me. And he said he couldn't reach others. And he started to ask me about something dealing with Georgia and preserving something potentially for appeal. Uh, and I said to him, are you out of your effing mind? Right? I said, I said, I only want to hear two words coming out of your mouth for now on. Orderly transition. <laughs> And he screamed and said, I don't want to hear any other effing words coming out of your mouth, no matter what, other than orderly transition. Repeat those words to me. And I screamed and he said, eventually he said, orderly transition. I said, good, John. Now I'm going to give you the best free legal advice you're ever getting in your life. Get a great effing criminal defense lawyer. You're going to need it. One of my favorite moments from the entire January 6th hearings, this moment where Eric Hirschman realized this was a White House attorney. OK, this is a guy who wanted Trump to win. Presumably he knew that what Eastman and others were doing was criminally problematic. And at a certain point, Hirschman realized this is over. This is over. All we need to be talking about is orderly transition. We lost. We will be vacating the White House. It's time to go. It's time to leave and get yourself a criminal defense attorney. Hirschman knew and Eastman now in bundles of problems and disbarred, which is a beautiful thing to see because it's what's appropriate given what he did and tried to do. Eastman and Ronna McDaniel, in a sense, are similar characters, individuals who did everything they could with the resources and connections they had to try to install a guy who lost in the Oval Office. It's not democracy. Eastman deserves all of it. And maybe there will even be more coming to him. We can only hope. If you value what we do at the David Pakman show, remember to support us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash David Pakman show where you can get access to behind the scenes videos, the daily bonus show, the commercial free daily show. You can support the show for as little as two dollars a month. Check it out at patreon.com slash David Pakman show. All right. I wouldn't normally subject you to this, but I am going to play a second Charlie Kirk clip on today's show. And it's because I want to talk about maybe the worst analogy I've ever heard for uh, being against trans people, just being who they are. And uh, we're going to look at this moment where uh, Charlie Kirk, of course, from Turning Point USA, does these events where he'll take questions from the crowd. It's often college students. They'll often make an attempt to confront him. And sometimes it goes well, sometimes it goes not so well. And here the topic of acceptance of um, LGBTQ people, quite frankly, is what is brought up. Charlie Kirk makes an analogy that talking about your gender identity is the same as saying, oh, I'm 20 years old. Well, I identify as a 40 year old. 
Many of you probably already realize this is a very dumb analogy, but let's listen to it and then we'll talk about it. Um, I was told to keep it short, so I will. Um, so you touched on LGBTQ rights a lot. You've talked about, you know, trans bathrooms, you getting banned from Twitter. Very, you know, awful. Um, but I'm wondering if I can get a straight answer, yes or no. Do you think the acceptance of queer people in society is a good thing? Well, define acceptance and define queer, because when I grew up, that was like a slander. So I don't know. That's like a thing now. Uh, queer, being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, um, and um, what was the other word? You what do you mean find? acceptance? What, what do you mean? Acceptance being that you know society, you know, you know, accepts that doesn't try to change that, doesn't try to um, say that it's not a social, like it's not a good thing for you to be gay, it's not a good thing for you to be trans, and um, and you know, in our institutions also just get, offering them resources to um, you know just come to terms with their sexuality, not feel bad about it, basically. By acceptance, I generally mean society shouldn't make people feel bad about who they are. So, do you all right, here's the that? critical no, part. No, I mean, we should feel bad about all sorts of things. So, I mean, yeah, happy to get the mic back up. But, I mean, I'll just ask you a very simple question, and this will tell what is a woman? A woman is someone who identifies as a woman. Got it. So, um, so, can, so do you think a definition of someone be, able to become pregnant would be a woman? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? So, if someone can become pregnant, would that person be defined as a woman? Depends on if they identify as a woman. Right. So, okay, we're now getting to the root of the issue. So do you believe that truth is objective or subjective? Do you believe in absolute truth? Sure. Okay, so if you believe in absolute truth, shouldn't we have absolute terms of what a infant-bearing or infant-birthing person is, otherwise known as a woman? No. Okay, so let me ask you, let me ask you this a different way, I suppose. So if anyone can identify anything at any time, correct? Anyone can identify as a woman or a man. You can just choose at any time, right? Gender. Well, sure. gender identity isn't switching genders all the time. It just depends. Like, but that's your position, right? That's fair to say that you could change your gender. My position is that you should accept people's gender identity, and you shouldn't right. try okay, to shame fine. them out. So of it. let me ask you: Should we should we accept people that think they're younger than they actually are? <laughs> <laughs> because that that is that's that's a mental condition where people say, I identify as an eight-year-old, but they're really 50. Should we accept someone be able to say they're younger? No, but I think that's a very false equivalence. Why is it a false equivalence? Because there's scientific research supporting that gender identity is something that is, you know, like, um, there's scientific research that supports people and says that if you identify as a certain gender, then that is, like, your gender. There's a paper on Scientific American that I found very interesting that said, like, you know, it's... All right, so... This kid is not the most prepared, but he's actually on to the right thing here. Charlie Kirk mentions, what about a mental condition where you identify as a different age than you are? Well, there is no such accepted condition, right? We have this thing called gender dysphoria. Now, I'm going to put out a couple disclaimers here because I'm going to defend this kid and tell you why all the things Charlie Kirk is saying don't make any sense. I'm the first to tell you. I don't think I fully understand every aspect of gender dysphoria and what trans folks go through or whatever. I'm open to the possibility that for some folks who identify as trans, it is becoming a catch all for some other unresolved strife. Like, for example, I know of people who something was not right in their life. And what they focused on was its diet. And they went through I eat only fruits and nuts to I eat only meat and eggs to. I, and the problem was never actually that it was unresolved stuff from childhood, etc. If you want to come to me and say, David, some of these people who say they're trans, it's actually just the expression of other. Stru I'm open to that being a possibility, but that's not actually what we're debating here. OK. The analogy to age. I'm 50, but I identify as 20. Age is a measure. And, and remember, Charlie wants to talk about what's objectively true. Age is a measure of the time someone has lived. It's tied to biological processes. It's tied to chronological facts. You can't alter them. It is universally measurable, at least in this universe, as far as we understand. And there's no personal interpretation. You can argue. It's like biological sex. And remember, trans folks don't deny that trans women know that they are trans women. OK, 
So in a sense, if you're 50 and you go to a doctor and they say, hey, we should do a colonoscopy based on your age and you say, no, 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 no. I identify as being 20, so I don't need a colonoscopy yet. Something is wrong. And if you insist on that, you might get referred for mental health treatment and rightly so. Similarly, if you're a biological woman and you go to a urologist, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm supposed to say cisgender woman. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but people know what I'm talking about. If you were born as a woman, biological female, and you go to a doctor uh, and you say, my testicles hurt, something is probably wrong. And if you insist as a biological woman without testicles that your testicles hurt, at some point we might say, maybe we need some kind of mental health involvement here. So, the the this is when we're talking about age and sex, when you want to talk about what's biologically true, gender is expressed on a spectrum. We know that whether you believe it to be, quote, legitimate or not indicative of gender dysphoria or something else, a topic for a biology versus a sociology or a psychology class. Hey, let's figure that out. But objectively, it is true that people express gender on a spectrum. Now, there's a whole bunch of other reasons why the analogy to age is no good. Legal age restrictions on things in society are based on average developmental stages when individuals are capable of making certain decisions. And there's a pur- purpose to those laws to protect individuals in society. Gender identity, I mean, it can have legal and social implications, but it's about an individual's understanding and expression of their own identity. It's about how people perceive themselves. It wouldn't re if all of a sudden we were to say, oh, you could be 40, but identify as 20. And therefore what it requires reevaluating social contracts and all sorts of other things. And of course, there is no scientific basis for it where we do have at least some scientific basis uh, for individuals who have a gender identity that doesn't match their their uh, biological genitalia. So this is such a terrible analogy, but the crowd full of Charlie Kirkites cheer and laugh and clap that he's making some great point. It's not a great point. The analogy is terrible. And if anything, we would say age is like biological sex and gender is a different thing altogether. A disheveled and swollen Donald Trump desperately is begging for cash. He looks stressed. His right eye is all it's just a slit. It's almost completely swollen shut. He looks off. And Trump says, I need your money. I need your cash, as he likes to say, to fight the prosecutors. That's the latest one. And but these Soros backed prosecutors and politicians, Democrats, all that are after us, we have to go out. We have to fight. They're communists, they're fascists, they're lunatics. And they just famous communist fascist prosecutors don't stop. They don't know how to give up. And you got to hand it to them for that. But that's the only thing you got to give them credit for. They're bad people. They're against our country. They don't want our country to make it. There's something wrong with them, but we're fighting. We're winning. You see what's going on. So whatever you can do to help financially (laughs) would be fantastic because we have to beat it. If it's five dollars or ten dollars or a hundred dollars, whatever you can do. And but these. So Trump is begging for what Trump's begging people who barely have money to make it to next week to chip in to help him fight supposed Marxist Soros backed fascist prosecutors directed by Joe Biden through no fault of his own and completely unfairly. That's where we are right now. Really a man of the people going to people making twenty nine thousand dollars a year and saying, can you chip in five, ten or a hundred bucks for me so I can pay my high priced lawyers and complain about how I'm being treated unfairly while flying around on my private plane and uh, winning golf tournaments at courses that I own and trophies that I pay for. This is where we are at this stage of the game. And I am not advocating for some kind of nanny state protections or whatever for people who want to donate to this guy and are being bamboozled by this guy. But at a certain point, are fools and their money eventually parted? In other words, if after everything we've gone through since 2015, almost nine years of this insanity. Wow, it's hard to hard to believe it's been that long. Um, Do we care about the people that can't afford it but are still donating to Trump? Or do we say, listen, you deserve it at the end of the day? How far does our empathy go? I don't know the answer. 
You tell me how much protection do the disinformed Trump cultists deserve when it comes to sending him their money? I don't know. Let me know what you think. I have a voicemail number that you can call any time of day. It's two one nine two David P. That's two one nine two three two eight four three seven. Here is a voicemail from a caller who's really confused and he's confused for a good reason. These MAGA people call me and they attack me for things I've never actually said. What? Hey, David, it's Tommy. I'm a little behind on your shows. But listening to this guy calling you David Hackman and talking about you, you know, visiting with Kamala Harris and so on. Are there like super duper secret shows that you make that no one else knows about? That yeah, they only the MAGA people see the shows that I make for them. Get all this weird that stuff and things that you just don't say. Because it's really odd because I've been listening to you for the last, oh gosh, going on almost three years and I've never heard you say any of these things. But yet somehow they think you said these things. So maybe, I'm obviously messing around, but that there's like a super secret David Pakman show that we don't know about. Listen, obviously this is the only show, but the regularity with which people call me and say, David, I can't believe you said this. David, I can't believe you said that. And it's stuff I've never said. You would almost think they must be reacting to some other show. I think it's two things. One, people call in and react to what they may be wrongly assume I said, or people get confused. Sometimes I get emails from people reacting to something Brian Tyler Cohen said, for example, and it wasn't me. It was him. But for some reason, they email me. He sent me emails of people writing to him about things I've said. It's all a confused mishmash. So we're going to do the best we can to disaggregate all of it. And we'll continue doing it on the bonus show. We are going to talk about the new litmus test that the RNC is putting in place to vet that new hires are MAGA, full on hardcore MAGA. We will talk about Visa and MasterCard settling a long running antitrust suit over swipe fees. And we will talk about the death of Daniel Kahneman at 90, an extraordinary thinker whose books I've been recommending for a very long time. He has passed away at 90. I'll tell you a little bit about my. Uh, personal interactions with them, all of these stories and more on the bonus show. Sign up at joinpacman.com, get instant access, and I'll be back tomorrow with a new show as well. Thanks a lot for watching today's show. I just want to take a second to tell you about today's sponsors. Our sponsor Cook Unity is the only meal subscription that brings locally sourced meals from award winning chefs right to your door every week. Cook Unity is a collective of some of the best chefs in the country, handcrafting meals in their micro kitchens delivered fresh, never frozen. There are hundreds of dishes to choose from. The menu is updated constantly. Pick as few as four or as many as 16 meals per week. Go to cookunity.com slash Pacman and use the code Pacman before checkout for 50% off your first week.